It is the only international court that can prosecute individuals for genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Supporters say it deters would-be criminals and offers justice to victims of atrocities. But critics accuse it of being a tool of Western imperialism or mainly punishing individuals from weaker states while ignoring crimes committed by more powerful countries. Now, as his chief prosecutor seeks arrest warrants against senior Israeli and Hamas leaders, People in Power asks, is the ICC fit for purpose? Saturday, October 7th, 2023. Hamas fighters bulldoze Israel's security fence and pour through from Gaza. Body cameras film their assault. Around 1,200 people are killed and they drag hundreds of Israelis back to Gaza as hostages. International crimes says the International Criminal Court's Chief Prosecutor, Karim Khan. Extermination, murder, the taking of hostages, rape, and other acts of sexual violence during captivity as crimes against humanity and as war crimes. Criminal too, he thinks, are many of the tactics used in Israel's devastating war. Its bombing campaign and ground invasion of Gaza has killed many, many times more people than Hamas did and has pushed the Strip to the brink of famine. The crimes include starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, willful killing or murder, and intentionally directing attacks against a civilian population. On May the 21st, Karim Khan announced he was applying for arrest warrants for Yahya Sinwar, Mohammed Daif, and Ismail Khania, all Hamas leaders and for Israeli Defence Minister Yoav Gallant and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who was predictably furious. It's a moral outrage of historic proportions. It will cast an everlasting mark of shame on the international court. Meanwhile, the United States has rushed to Israel's defence. We reject the ICC's application for arrest warrants against Israeli leaders. Whatever these warrants may imply, there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas. For Gaza's destitute, hungry and bloodied people, there's no equivalence either. Israel, with its drones, bombs and diplomatic protection, is infinitely more powerful, infinitely more dangerous. Mahmoud and his family fled at the beginning of the war moving three times since. Now, they're eking an existence amongst the rubble of their old home. The news from the ICC has at least given them some hope. The ICC's investigation here predates this brutal war. It's been looking at alleged crimes in the occupied territories stretching back to 2014. This, however, is the court's first concrete step towards prosecutions. But there's still a long way to go before the hopes of Palestinians like Mahmoud are realised. The International Criminal Court will have to prove its many doubters wrong. It must resist huge political pressure and overcome long-standing criticisms for pursuing selective justice. War crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. This court was created to hold those responsible accountable and prevent such crimes from happening again. So, is the ICC fit for purpose? 
Compared to other multilateral institutions, the ICC is still young. Its founding treaty, the Rome Statute, was signed in 1998 and the court started four years later. 124 states are now members, but there are big ones missing. Major powers are, are not part of it. Not the United States, not China, not Russia, not India, not Pakistan, not Israel. Like the International Court of Justice, the ICC sits in the Dutch city of The Hague. Whereas the ICJ hears disputes between states, the ICC prosecutes individuals and is supposed to be the court of last resort when local justice fails. The ICC only has jurisdiction if uh, the country is, is unwilling or unable to genuinely investigate and prosecute. Arrests are supposed to be carried out by member states as the court has no police force. Judges decide whether a defendant is guilty or not guilty and also if reparation should be paid to victims. But the court has moved slowly, with just 11 people convicted in 22 years. Notably, most of them have been Africans. The ICC costs money. Its last budget for, for 24 is, is, I think, 187 million euros. Uh, that's about 200 million uh, US dollars. This comes from member states, though governments and other entities can make voluntary contributions. Stephen Rapp was President Obama's ambassador at large for war crimes and a man who wishes the US had signed up. It's very, very unfortunate, and it would be a better process if America were involved in it. How able is the ICC to resist the political pressure it's under at the moment? Do you think it's getting the political support that it needs? As, as a general rule, uh, I don't think the court has gotten the political support that it has needed. Are the Israel-Palestine cases make or break for the ICC? The, the Netanyahu case will be, be a challenging one. Uh, bringing him into custody would really require an aggressive effort to basically negotiate his, his transfer. And I don't anticipate that that would happen. If the court is, is unsuccessful, then there will be states that are basically concluding this court's not sort of fit for purpose. Stephen, if we're to get a sense of where the ICC has succeeded and failed, where should we go? I mean, you can see examples of it in, in, in the cases the, the court has been able to try from Congo and Uganda, which were, which were successful. Uh, and, and then in the case of Kenya, uh, where it failed. First, the success. From the late 1980s through 2012, Lord's Resistance Army rebels kill, rape, maim and kidnap their way across northern Uganda. The UN says they kill more than 100,000 people and abduct almost as many children. Lukodi was one of the places caught in the whirlwind. It's hard to imagine now, but in May 2004, Lukodi here was a huge camp for thousands of people who fled from their homes because of LRA assaults. But on the 19th, they attacked again. The rebels fanned through the camp, shooting, cutting people down and burning them to death in their huts. Nearly 70 people were killed. This is the man of me. Where's your daughter's name? My daughter's name is Akelo Lelobo. This one here? This, this one Akelo. Here. I lost my daughter and some of my relatives. What have been the long-term impacts of these horrific events on this community? When you go, I was like, 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 I was in 2021, the ICC sentenced LRA commander Dominic Ongwen to 25 years in prison. He was the man behind the attack on Lukodi and at least three other camps. Do you think the ICC has delivered justice for people here in this community and for Uganda as a whole? <laughs> Another village devastated by the LRA was a beer. This is our home. This old area, this is where the IDP camp for a beer started from. It started from all the way here, stretching to the other direction. It's where Victor Ochen grew up, a child of conflict and poverty. And it was a camp of about 70,000 people. 70,000 people here? Yeah. We grew up here witnessing so many atrocities, and my brother was actually abducted right from here. So this place has been through a lot, and you've been through a lot. 
the community didn't know anything to do with peace. It was all about war and suffering. So it's a community that did not see much happiness. Victor's African Youth Initiative Network took a lead role in getting the ICC to investigate LRA crimes. So Victor, Africa's youngest ever Nobel Peace Prize nominee, is a big believer in the court. I would say probably about four major achievements that the ICC intervention in Uganda brought. One, it gave hope to the population that at least we are going to be listened to international, internationally. And then the second achievement, it is significantly deterred the escalation of LRA war. The third achievement, it was the ICC arrest warrant that forced the government of Uganda to start protecting people of northern Uganda. And then the last achievement, it gave opportunity for international communities to understand the reality of northern Ugandans were going through because it was invisible war. How do you respond to the criticism of the ICC that it mainly goes after Africans? The big question should be, do we have these crimes against humanity, genocide and war crimes happening in Africa or not? If they are there, why should it be that we need to reach a point where we're debating whether who should kill, why should I be taken to court because I've killed my people, yet you are not taken to court because you've killed your people? I think that's a very silly argument that I, I find it so offensive as a victim, as a survivor of war. And yet, Victor knows there have been flaws. Ongwin's victims will share a $56 million ICC reparations trust fund. That's about $800 each. But some communities, including Abir, weren't mentioned in the court case, so people here will get nothing. So this is my family, and uh, I am happy to introduce you to my lovely 84 years father and my fantastic sister-in-law, Betty. When the LRA took Victor's brother, Betty lost her husband. Betty, some communities are going to receive compensation from the ICC for what they went through, but this community, as far as we know, won't. Does that hurt? Mi wando utau ni nyo wani kandong pirwa petek umi odong poti apa ar pirwa uberu kere gen eto genwa beru nono. Victor is worried. We would be so disappointed if the ICC reparation would come and tear down the society that we worked so hard to rebuild for the last time. We hope that any effort for justice would not create more injustice. Otherwise, society that has been struggling to heal, almost woven, will be again broken apart. So success, but with big caveats. To see what real failure looks like, step across the border to neighboring Kenya. 2007, presidential hopeful Raila Odinga challenges the results of elections declared for the incumbent, Mwai Kibaki. The country erupts in protests and ethnic violence. It was the most dramatic and intense violence Kenya had ever seen following an election since independence. Really, Kenya's near-death experience. Over a thousand people are killed and hundreds of thousands more are forced from their homes. It was deemed that, that this had been fueled by political actors, and so the, the International Criminal Court embarked on an investigation. Six high-profile Kenyans are accused by the ICC, including then Deputy Prime Minister Uhura Kenyatta and Education Minister William Ruto. Journalist and anti-corruption campaigner John Githongo watched as one by one the cases fell apart. The ICC, as well-meaning as they may have been, uh, simply uh, weren't up to scratch. Kenya has the most experienced and well-resourced political elite on this side of the continent of Africa. And so they took down the ICC. It was fairly easy for them. How did they do that? How, how were those cases collapsed? Witnesses changed the statements. Some witnesses you know, disappeared into thin air, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it was a difficult case for the ICC to prosecute. All deny any involvement in the post-election violence, as well as any accusation they intimidated witnesses. Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto went onwards and upwards. Both became presidents of Kenya, a role that Ruto currently holds. Kareem Khan was then Ruto's defence lawyer. Here he is as the trial began, tearing down the case presented by the very office he'll go on to lead. What a lamentable shambles. 
the prosecution investigation has been. A parody of justice. A parody of justice is how it feels to many in Kenya, though not quite as Karim Khan meant it. This is Kabira, Nairobi's largest slum, one of the epicenters of that post-election violence and home to campaign group Grace Agenda. Our organisation is survival-led, survival-born, survival-run um, for reparations and justice for the post-election violence. Jacqueline Materi set up Grace Agenda to help others like her. She was raped and fell pregnant in the violence. They decided that since the structures of um, the Kenyan system would not serve justice for anybody, so they decided let's we are signatories to the ICC, and so uh, we should go to the ICC. And so everybody was saying, they said, don't be vague, ask for the Hague. And that's, the, that, that, that's where they went. If it's an international court, they must serve justice. Do you still have faith in the ICC? The ICC is zero because it was delivering justice, I think, to, I think maybe to an international theater of sorts. That's what they were playing to. They did not intend for victims and survivors to get justice itself because they would have gone the full nine yards to ensure that some sort of harm is compensated to survivors, but they did not do that. Once the court process filled through, everything else crumbled like dominoes. The Kenya and Uganda cases tell us that renegade warlords are easier to convict than anyone with real power and protection. That's assuming they can even be arrested. 17 ICC suspects are still at large, including Sudan's former president, Omar al-Bashir. His 2009 warrant was never executed, despite visiting many countries that were obligated to arrest him. Also on the list is Russian president Vladimir Putin. Over the last 20 years, there has not been one single state official that has been prosecuted. Some of the strongest criticism of the ICC comes from those with the highest hopes for its success. Our hopes have not been uh, realised, and I think, more importantly, uh, the goals set up for and by the ICC have not been met. We just have to look around to know that that system has failed people and has failed the victims. Amnesty International lobbied for the court's creation, but now warns that it's in danger of being bought. The office is, has been forced seemingly to seek voluntary contribution from member states because the overall budget is not being met to the extent that is required. Those voluntary contributions come with a price tag. Strings attached. Strings attached. So how have we seen that influence playing out in real terms? Well, we have certainly seen that being played out in the context of Ukraine. In March 2023, just a year after Russia invaded Ukraine, the ICC issued arrest warrants for Russian President Vladimir Putin and his commissioner for children's rights, Maria Lvova Belova. They're accused of deporting children from Ukraine to Russia. Four other top Russian officials have since been indicted. Russia rejects the allegations. Let me be very clear. We at Amnesty International really saluted what the Office of the Prosecutor has done on Ukraine. So the warrants for Putin and Lvova Belova and, and the others, they are valid. Exactly. Right? But the voluntary contribution from Western state to the Office for their investigation into Ukraine give the impression that this prosecution, this investigation, those arrest warrant can be the product of the influence of member state and not um, a truly impartial process. Where do you think these strings have been attached to stop or prevent investigations? An investigation into the uh, uh, UK possible violations in Iraq. So that investigation was closed. Uh, a second case is that related to allegations of torture by American and Afghan forces in Afghanistan. That investigation was deprioritized. But for Agnes, the ICC's Israel and Hamas announcement was welcome news. Uh, they signal a determination on the part of the International Criminal Court to go for um, a state 
leader that is associated with the Western world. And that too will be a very welcome step. Uh, it will allow the International Criminal Court to demonstrate its impartiality, to demonstrate that it is not um, the, the object of undue influence and pressure, and is certainly not uh, implementing a double standard vision of justice. As ICC judges weigh up Gaza arrest warrants, Karim Khan knows political pressure will be intense. Indeed, the Guardian newspaper and Israeli magazines Plus 972 and Local Call say Israel's been waging a clandestine spy campaign against the court for nine years. And I insist that all attempts to impede, to intimidate or to improperly influence the officials of this court cease immediately. He also knows he's taken on huge stakes. It's my strong conviction that if we do not demonstrate our willingness to apply the law equally, if it is seen as being applied selectively, we will be creating the conditions for its complete collapse. Of course, we asked many times for an interview with Mr Khan, but we were told he wasn't available. Hello, Fadi. Nice to meet you, I'm Rory. However, the court spokesperson, Fadi El Abdullah, was. We wanted to put to him the criticisms we've heard. First, Amnesty International's funding concerns. There is no possibility to use the voluntary contributions to gain any influence over the ongoing investigations. The core business of the court is funded by the budget of the court, where it's not about voluntary contribution, it's a mandatory um, participation to the ICC budget for all the states' parties. The ICC investigation uh, into British potential war crimes in Iraq had, had essentially been dropped. Why, why was it dropped? Well, it was not an investigation. It was a preliminary examination to decide whether or not to open an investigation. And then that has stopped based on the fact that the judicial system in the UK was looking into uh, similar cases as well. And if there are genuine investigations on the national level, then by law, the prosecutor cannot go ahead and open this investigation. In Uganda, we heard that the ICC is concentrating too much on prosecuting the perpetrators and not enough on the fair compensation of victims. How do you respond to that? Well, we have to clarify that the ICC is not a humanitarian aid organization. The main focus of the ICC has to remain the investigation and trying to establish the individual criminal responsibility for these suspects. Now, that's something we know it couldn't do in Kenya. Fadi tells me lack of evidence obliged the court to drop the cases and that it launched a prosecution against a Kenyan lawyer accused of interfering with witnesses. However, this case was closed too when the lawyer was found dead in his Nairobi home. Oh, welcome to courtroom three. Then Fadi showed me the courtrooms where, in a possible future, the leaders of Israel and Hamas might one day sit as defendants. So do you see this as the world's highest criminal court? It is the only international permanent criminal court uh, in the world. We don't perceive ourselves as higher than others, but as complementary to the other. And when there is no other venue on the national level, uh, then victims will still feel that there is a possibility for them to see justice done. The ICC has many critics. But what we've also heard is that most people want the court to do well. If you were marking the ICC's report card at the moment, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what kind of report you, you, would you, you give it? You still give it a gentleman's C, I think, in terms of its, of its performance. We want the ICC to be a 600-pound gorilla. We want, we want it, it to be so effective that if you get charged at the ICC, you're going to get arrested and you're going to get tried. There's a strong probability that you're going to be convicted and punished. If it doesn't, ha if it doesn't have that perception, then it makes it much harder for it to convince countries to do the very hard work, which is very hard and always unpopular, of, of prosecuting their, their own men and women who've been out fighting for the country's interests, but who committed uh, abuses and crimes while doing so. All eyes are on the ICC now. And ultimately, success won't be measured in arrest warrants. They can be evaded. They are evaded. True success is powerful people sat in the ICC courtrooms answering for the crimes they're accused of.